Okay. So today I want to talk about nuclear proliferation, which I think is kind of the most, uh, or one of the major, I'll say one of the major arguments on the topic. A lot of the other impacts are related to it, uh, which we can talk about, but this is kind of one of the most significant issues um, that's accessible at the link level by both the pro uh, and the con. And it's, it's all over the, the nuclear, the no first use literature. Now, technically, there are two types of proliferation. Proliferation is a, you know, just a general term that refers to the spread of something, right? You, you see this term used in biology a lot. Um, in the context of international security, it's usually talking about the spread of nuclear weapons. Technically, there are two types of proliferation. There's vertical proliferation and there's horizontal proliferation. So vertical proliferation um, is usually referred to as an arms race. That's where countries that already, in this case, context, already have nuclear weapons, they're going to develop more nuclear weapons. That's called vertical proliferation. Horizontal proliferation is when uh, nuclear weapons spread amongst more countries, right? So uh, right now there are eight nuclear powers. If we have nine or 10 or become 11, that becomes horizontal proliferation. Um, so I'll kind of, I won't really talk about vertical proliferation. That's really like arms race issues. Some of these will come up in this discussion, but that's generally kind of not what this, um, you know, this talk is about. So what is the status quo? So in the status quo, we have five kind of major nuclear powers, all who got nuclear weapons before 1970. Uh, before 1970 is significant because this is when the non-proliferation treaty or the NPT went into effect. And this is considered part of the non-proliferation regime, which I'll talk about very shortly a little bit more. Okay, and then you have kind of maybe what I would call potential proliferation. All of these, for the most part, all right, or I shouldn't say all, and then for the most part, most of these are US allies, right? So Japan, South Korea, Germany, Taiwan, Saudi Arabia, like Australia, like these countries um, could go nuclear, at least within like a very sh kind of short period of time, you know, like probably a year, um, maybe less. They have obviously the economic capacity, they have the technological know-how, um, if they really wanted to develop nuclear weapons, they could. And there are some that, like Iran, it's obviously not a U.S. ally, right? The U.S. is always kind of um, pressuring kind of not to develop nuclear weapons, probably has the, the technological infrastructure um, to build nuclear weapons, probably has the economic capacity. I mean, Iran's economy is obviously struggling, especially, you know, under coronavirus. But, you know, even countries that are poor, Unless they're incredibly poor, they can usually divert enough resources into the military or nuclear infrastructure to develop these types of weapons. But this will become important too for later when we talk about, well, gee, like which countries like would develop nuclear weapons under which, you know, situations, right? So, you know, you have some that a lot that are U.S. allies and then like you kind of have one that's like not, you know. Then there's kind of others. I should too have put Turkey in the, the allies list. Um, there are a couple countries that had nuclear weapons that gave them up, mostly either South Africa um, or country, uh, former Soviet states like Belarus, Kazakhstan, and Ukraine. Like when the Soviet Union split up, right, now we have these republics, they kind of agreed to like get rid of like their nuclear weapons. It's actually very controversial, like when Russia invaded, invaded part of the Ukraine, right? It's like Ukraine gave up its nuclear weapons. Um, U.S. kind of like supposed to like support them, right? Like you know, we don't want to go to war with Russia, but obviously they still had nuclear weapons and maybe Russia would have been a little bit more reluctant. So anyhow, that's kind of where we are. There's really not a lot of countries, if you think about it, that have nuclear weapons, especially if you consider the fact that, you know, it was in the 40s, 50s, you know, early 60s that the major powers got their nuclear weapons, right? And then only since 1970 have really had a few other countries um, go nuclear. Oh, Israel, I meant to explain. Israel, People think Israel has nuclear weapons, that they have around 200 nuclear weapons, but I say it's unofficial. Everyone will say it's unofficial because they've never disclosed that. They've never said, oh, hey, we have nuclear weapons. Uh, the reason they do that is a lot of people think if they kind of brandished it, came out, that would maybe signal an intent to use. But Israel, obviously, too, is a, a U.S. ally that probably has nuclear weapons. The only difference is that they have not been disclosed. So just a little bit more about the non-proliferation treaty. Um, I had spoke about this kind of briefly in the first lecture, and even this is kind of not a lot more, but the NPT is a landmark international treaty, all right, whose objective is to spread 
are, are to prevent the spread of nuclear weapons and technology. And it, it was kind of what you basically have as a grand bargain. It said, hey, other countries beyond those like first five, right? Okay, this came into effect in 1970. Other than beyond those first five, like you should not be developing um, nuclear weapons and in exchange we will like commit to eventual disarmament. They say, obviously, as I said in the last lecture, that hasn't been fulfilled. And we'll also like support you having peaceful nuclear technology, right? Now, like this, the separation, like obviously at the end of this, like behind me is a nuclear explosion, okay? A controlled nuclear explosion is what creates nuclear power, right? So like, you know, how we're separating these two is something that inspectors and countries are like always arguing about, right? The idea was, hey, we'll also help you get peaceful nuclear energy if you don't agree to kind of develop the bomb. Another big treaty that's a part of this, and I, I probably wouldn't even have mentioned it if something significant had happened, is the Comprehensive Test Ban Treaty. This treaty, it's a treaty that the US has not ratified, says that countries should not test nuclear weapons, continue to test it. Why? Well, you know, if you don't keep testing, then eventually maybe you, you force yourself into that disarmament goal as your kind of nuclear capacity atrophies. It also kind of obviously causes pretty serious environmental harms, environments to communities near where the, the tests occur, right? It's also <laughs> could kind of be threatening. Now, the US has not ratified this treaty, but just kind of last week, I think it was this treaty went into effect. A treaty can go into effect, meaning it's still legally binding. Obviously the US is like, kind of just gonna say we're not gonna comply with it, but it is legally binding because Honduras just recently ratified it. Um, so, you know, the pros gonna talk about like how this non-proliferation regime and the NPT is kind of like under assault and we're not abiding and strengthening these norms, like these non-proliferation norms by continuing to threaten the first use of nuclear weapons. But like, here we are like kind of threatening the first use of nuclear weapons and like the CTBT goes into effect. And kind of as a point of alternative causality, the US is still not um, ratified the treaty. All right. Now, this is some a question to think about. Why might countries go nuclear? Why might they develop nuclear weapons? This is important to understand. I never really, I always kind of skipped this section of the books when I was like a debater like you. I've been debating this since 1988, um, if you, 87, when I went to debate camp and the topic was Latin America. And we talked about the potential for Brazil and Argentina to get nuclear weapons. Okay. so. I'd always kind of skip that to kind of go look for the impact cards or the solvency cards, right? But it is important to understand why countries might go nuclear because it, especially in this topic, that gets it like the solvency cards, right? Like is ratifying, is, or excuse me, is adopting a no first use posture going to really change countries' motivation? So think about why might you develop a nuclear weapon? Like, well, for prestige. Like look who has the nuclear weapons, the major powers. Right? Doesn't everybody want to be like China, Russia, the United States? Who wants to be like a secondary or tertiary power? If the major country, uh, countries have nuclear weapons, like doesn't everybody else want them? The second is an economic deal. Well, what does that mean? Well, maybe if I get nuclear weapons or I threaten to get nuclear weapons and another big power doesn't want me to have them, then maybe they'll give me like a big like aid package in order to get me to give up my nuclear weapons, or they'll maybe give me a bunch of like nuclear technology. Or maybe they'll give me something else that I want. Maybe they'll like let me in some trade agreement, right? So I might kind of threaten to develop nuclear weapons, even though I don't really care to have them, in order to kind of make a deal. <coughs> the third thing is security. So there's a, diff a lot of different ways to look at this, right? Like you could fear that you're going to be attacked, okay? United States invaded Iraq, okay, and kind of, you know, after some time, like, kind of really honestly kind of quickly won the war, in relative, like, war times. Now, you can say, okay, we got kind of, like, bogged down in this thing, and it was hard to stabilize the country. That's true, okay, but we did kind of pretty quickly, like, win the war. Uh, we have not attacked North Korea. You th anyone here think we're, we might attack North Korea? What would, what would like be a serious downside related to this topic of the United States attacking North Korea? Like, what might they use? Right, well, they could use like a nuclear weapon, right? Okay, 
It could use a nuclear weapon. So it kind of creates some deterrence. They may fear attack, right? They may fear attack. They may fear, you know, so countries are insecure. Okay. And so they developed that reason. They may fear losing a war. Right. We talked about this in the first class. Well, how might the U.S. decide to use nuclear weapons first? The U.S. might decide to use nuclear weapons first because, you know, we're being overrun or our allies are being overrun. Look, we use nuclear weapons against Japan because we feared there would be too many civilian casualties otherwise on our side. Right. OK. The third is maybe you want to start a war. Like countries do start wars. Right. Um, maybe you want to make a deal. <coughs> That's a big factor. Like North Korea keeps doing this. Like, all right, let's kind of get some nuclear weapons. Let's threaten it, make a deal. I just put this one here a little bit different than the deal I talked about above. I tried to describe those all in economic terms. These are kind of also in security terms. Also, do they get like their security from someone else or like fear being attacked, right? In other words, like, okay, I might get nuclear weapons because I don't think I can defend myself with my own conventional weapons, but maybe I won't because somebody else is defending me. That's the extended deterrence argument that we talked about and plays a big role in this topic. Okay, why might countries not go nuclear? Well, they might lack the means. They might not have the economic and, the, and or the technical means to do so. And the non-proliferation regime arguably can constrain those technical means, right, by denying certain types of technology transfer. There may be norms, right? Like, oh, it, it's kind of look like, you know, nuclear weapons really haven't spread. It, it, you know, if you develop nuclear weapons and you don't have them, there's going to be a, like a lot of animosity to you internationally. They could fear sanctions, right? Both like on general kind of sanctions on their economy or sanctions on their nuclear industry, which could hurt their, hurt their civilian and their nuclear uh, I mean, they're, they're kind of non-nuclear and their nuclear infrastructure, right? Because if you violate the NPT, you could be vulnerable to sanctions. Um, there could be great power pressure, right? Like countries are aligned with other countries. Um, they care a lot about the opinions of other countries. If a big power, like if you're aligned with the United States, the United States doesn't want you to go nuclear, you may very well might, might not do it because you could lose a lot of other security or economic benefits that you gain from that. Um, relationship. There can be internal political pressure, right? Like, hey, we don't want our country to develop nuclear weapons because this will make us look bad in the world. This will make us vulnerable to attack. Like, you know, just there's popular pressure against it. So these are some like a lot of different factors, like, right? So we can kind of flip back, like, why might they go nuclear? Why might they not? Uh, there's a, a couple important things, right? Like there are different reasons why they might and different reasons why they might not. It's just like, it's not like a clear thing all the time. It's not like, well, like one of the, you know, in debate, we're going to point to one factor and say like, if we change that factor, we're going to stop them from like proliferating. Or if we change that factor, that's going to cause them to want to go nuclear, right? But the reality is there are kind of like multiple factors like at play and you can't control them all. And some in particular situations may become very important. Okay, but nonetheless, that's kind of like where they are. Now, let's look at a specific context, North Korea. Why might North Korea go nuclear? And I, I, I should have phrased the, con the question in the past tense a little bit, right? But why did North Korea go nuclear? Okay, in 2006, they left the, the non-proliferation treaty and said they had nuclear weapons. Well, why? I mean, there's some different reasons. One, they want prestige. Okay, it is prestigious as a country. They don't have a lot going for them, right? Like, <laughs> it's like an economic mess, like people starve to death, like there's disease, they're like locked out from the outside world, like they can be like, look, we have nuclear weapons. We are a major power. There are only, right, seven other countries with like, these nuclear weapons. We're like completely powerful. They may want to make some kind of deals, right, as part of a negotiation. <clears throat> now, you always make deals in a negotiation, which is Kind of one thing that's funny about debate arguments, right? It's like people will be like, oh, if we have a no first use posture, North Korea won't be afraid anymore that we're going to use nuclear weapons first. So they'll just give them up. It's like, okay, but when you just do it with, it's not part of a deal. Like, why would they give them up? Like, what do they have to lose by keeping them? It like, doesn't make any sense, right? Okay, and we can talk about that. That was something in the demo debate if you watched it, right? Okay, they want to, maybe they want to attack South Korea. 
So think about it. They may use they want to use the nuclear weapons in a direct attack on South Korea, or they may want to have the nuclear weapons. Now there, there's been recently in the news that North Korea is developing their own ICBMs, intercontinental ballistic missiles, that they can shoot at the United States. Okay, well, why are they developing these? Do they really want to attack the United States? Probably not. That's kind of silly, right? They would get obliterated. But if they want to attack South Korea, and they have, the, say, say North Korea launches a conventional war on South Korea, which they could potentially win, okay? And you say, well, they wouldn't do that because the U.S. might drop a nuclear weapon on North Korea. Say, well, the U.S. wouldn't do that because the U.S. knows if they did that, that North Korea would shoot nuclear weapons at Los Angeles. Okay, so we wouldn't trade Los Angeles to defend Seoul, the capital of South Korea, right? So North Korea can say that these weapons have important functions in wartime. They could fear a U.S. attack, whether it's conventional or nuclear, which is an important thing to consider when you're debating this topic. Like literally in this demo debate, they're like, if we give up nuclear weapons, North Korea will, I mean, if we give up, we, if we give up our first use posture, North Korea will no longer be afraid and they'll give up their nuclear weapons. Well, think about all the other weapons we have that they're gonna be afraid of. Like we have bombers that have conventional weapons. We have something called the mother of all bombs, which like penetrates into the earth. Okay, we have global surveillance networks. We now have swarms of drones, okay? We have cruise missiles, right? So just because we're not gonna nuke them first, right, does not mean that they don't have any use for their nuclear weapons. Right? They, at the very least, kind of probably still want to deter the United States. But that's kind of why it's important to understand, like, these basic ideas. Because as we all know, in public forum, you don't have a lot of prep time. Debaters try to come up with these tricky, weird arguments in the demo debate. You know, I was like, oh, I hadn't really thought of that North Korea thing, probably because I've literally never seen a piece of evidence that says that. Like, I literally, I literally do not think a piece of evidence exists. That says if the U.S. adopts a no first use posture, that North Korea will give up its nuclear weapons. It literally makes no sense. Okay, they want prestige. They're always trying to make deals. They think they're gonna that we're gonna attack them with conventional weapons. They probably wouldn't believe us, right? Like, but in order to kind of get it all that in the debate, you kind of have to know all that in your head. It's very easy to find recent evidence. It kind of just says the cat's out of the bag that the US can work with North Korea to like try to minimize the number of weapons they develop, to try to get them to more security protections, to try not to transfer them abroad, maybe to like put pressure to like keep the ICBMs from like not working properly, but there's no way in the world they're gonna give up their nuclear weapons, okay? No way in the world. In the Korean War, when we bombed North Korea, we killed off like 15% of its population. They do not like us. Okay, I'm not trying to like say they're right about that. Obviously, we're in a war, right? You do what you got to do to win the war, and the war's not even over technically, right? But they don't like the United States, and they don't have a lot going for them. So to me, it's literally absurd to say that if we adopt a no first use posture, that North Korea is going to get rid of its nuclear weapons. But the only way you can really say that in a debate is if you kind of understand these things and then at least have some evidence kind of ready to go, right? Um, so I just kind of wanted to talk through that as an example, because in like, you know, we can talk more at the end too, like in the context, like which countries would go nuclear, how would they be constrained? It's, it's very easy to like, and it happens in debate all the time. You kind of have these general discussions. But when you get to the specifics, it gets a little more tricky. Okay, so how might no first use impact proliferation? There's two main ways. One is the pro way, right? We're gonna say if the US adopts a no first use posture, then the non proliferation the US will be like kind of a little bit more on this path toward disarmament. We'll support the non proliferation regime. It will become stronger. Other countries will support us, right? There'll be maybe a little more willingness to implement sanctions, maybe a little more pressure on Iran. I just bring Iran up because I don't know what other country is about to go nuclear. It's not an ally of the United States, right? So people, you know, the, 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 the pro team will read these great pieces of evidence. It says like, oh, the NPT is on the brink of collapse. It was ironic since the CTBT just went into force. Okay, and the people, people, I read evidence in 1988 that says the NPT was on the brink of collapse. And I've probably coached nuclear weapons topics 10 times since then. And every time I've coached debaters to say that the non-proliferation regime is like on the brink of collapse and could collapse at any moment. 
okay? But it's obviously quite strong. Since 1970, only three additional countries have acquired nuclear weapons, okay? So it's quite a strong regime, but I'm saying people are gonna say it's gonna collapse, that proliferation are gonna say, oh, well, once one country gets nuclear weapons, other countries will get nervous, so it'll spread around the world. If you ask them in Crossfire, like, well, which countries are about to get nuclear weapons? Like, how does this spread? They'll, they kind of won't really be able to answer. Those are tough questions to answer. Um, but anyhow, there, there's kind of this idea that you're gonna strengthen these non-proliferation norms. Then the second thing is there's the like, well, we're gonna reduce the threat, like I just talked about, right? Like, <laughs> I mean, in the case of North Korea, they already have the weapons, but you know, they could vertically proliferate, get war, the US could threaten another country, right? If the US, I mean, why did, well, one motivation for Iran getting nuclear weapons is obviously the US threatens it. Now, again, the US is not, Iran is not mostly afraid, it's not, Iran is not really afraid that Trump's gonna wake up one day and just nuke Iran. Okay, but they are afraid that like we might start a conventional war and they would probably lose that conventional war to the United States. Like I don't, I don't think anybody says they wouldn't. I mean, it would be a horrible war. Okay, a lot of people on both sides would die. The economy would be devastated, but the US would eventually prevail in the end. So they want these nuclear weapons to deter a conventional attack. Okay, that is the primary, the primary fear all right, that a lot of countries have. But anyhow, that's the pro, right? And then the con, as I discussed last week, is really about security. This argument is referred to as assurances, all right, or allied proliferation. That these countries will feel insecure. Who am I talking about? Okay, again, our allies, Taiwan, Japan, there's a lot of stuff written about Japan, Germany, okay, South Korea, right? All potentially um, getting nuclear weapons, right? So. The pros team strategically will try to lever, get underneath that, right? And that's why they want to say like, gee, the NPT, the non-proliferation regime is going to collapse. And it's proliferation is inevitable. It's going to spread around the world, right? Like North Korea is going to keep building up its nuclear arsenal. If the NPT regime collapses, then a lot of the security and like trade regulations that go in there are going to collapse. It'll be easier for North Korea to get nuclear material. That means Japan's inevitably gonna get nuclear weapons. They're just gonna get too scared. They won't continue to rely on the United States. Same with South Korea, they're right there. Okay, so the pro, it's more like a strategic argument, right? Like to kind of get underneath the uniqueness of it all. Um, but the, anyhow, the, there are allies proliferating. And look, our allies are not gonna threaten us. They're not gonna, you know, Taiwan's not gonna launch a nuclear weapon in the United States, right? But we don't want there to be a nuclear war in Asia. Okay, beyond like the humanitarian consequences, okay, which would be terrible. Um, obviously, US citizens live in Taiwan, even if you just look at this from an American first perspective, US citizens live in Europe, US citizens live in China, like a million of them or something crazy like that, like 100,000 plus like live in Japan, we don't want our citizens to die, just because they live overseas. And obviously, it would just a nuclear a regional nuclear war would be like, devastating, economically. Plus, you know, you have the environmental effects potentially like spreading worldwide. Anyhow, we don't want there to be a nuclear war anywhere, not just like not in the United States. Okay. So the pro situations, what's a pro going to say? They, they could kind of like say they strengthen this regime. Okay, as I talked about, they, 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 these controls on the nuclear material, they are, it is hard when they get pressed, as I said, on like, what are the examples, maybe talk about Iran. There's the North Korea, they fear the US attack. We already kind of had that discussion on another slide. Other people say, well, Israel would never really disclose its nuclear weapons. Um, if the US adopted a no first use policy, probably like kind of silly, but kind of that's where it is. Con situations, right? Like who fears who? Well, Japan, they fear China and Russia. South Korea fears a North Korean attack. They fear China, they fear Japan. Just like look at the history of Okay, Asia, it's filled with wars and imperial powers, right? Taiwan obviously fears China, Germany fears Russia. Okay, Saudi Arabia probably doesn't factor in so directly, but Saudi Arabia would fear that like if the US, you know, maybe undermined its security guarantees that even though we don't have like a direct nuclear security guarantee for Saudi Arabia, they would generally kind of fear as it's like a larger part, this would be part of a larger policy or just the beginning of an unraveling of kind of the US security commitments and they might go nuclear. And those of you debated the Persian Gulf topic last uh, April, 
right? Or kind of, you know, already have arguments like evidence related to these arguments. Okay, now there's a whole other debate. Why is nuclear proliferation bad? Okay, well, look, I mean, obviously if a war starts with nukes, a lot of people will die. There's evidence says like an India-Pakistan nuclear war would kill millions of people, not just for the direct, not just because of the direct effects in India-Pakistan, but because the way the clouds would go up, it like, you know, would cause like a massive amount of pollution, the radiation would spread worldwide. All right, you're talking millions of deaths. It obviously increases war risks. Why? Well, terrorists could steal the weapons. Quote unquote crazy leaders. If you read the literature about nuclear proliferation, they say, well, there's these crazy leaders um, that could kind of use the nuclear weapons. Now, there's, there's a little bit of a kind of a racist overtone uh, here that, you know, supposedly like there's all these lunatics in these developing world that are just going to go out and start nuking people. I mean, obviously, this, you know, the craziest leader, Kim, in like North Korea hasn't nuked anyone. Uh, we arguably have a crazy leader living in the United States. He hasn't like started in a nuclear war, but you can also say that like, hey, that's why we're not really being racist. Like the U.S. could have a crazy, like any country could have a mentally deranged leader, regardless of what you think of Trump. Like somebody could control the nuclear arsenal and kind of not really have it all together, right? So you don't, you're not just saying, you're just saying that like the more countries that have these weapons, right? Like the more likely that there's going to be in a country that has a crazy leader. There's a greater risk of, you know, we talk about miscalculated wars. We talked about that last week, accidental wars, right? The more countries that have these weapons, the more likely those things are to happen. Now, why don't nuclear weapons deter? Like anyone say, okay, well, look, U.S. is Russia has thousands of nuclear weapons. The United States has thousands of nuclear weapons. This is not causing nuclear war. There's a lot of really good answers to this intuitive argument. Okay, the first one just kind of says like, we got lucky. I mean, obviously we almost had some nuclear wars, right? Like the Cuban Missile Crisis, like it's possible that like none of us like be, right? <laughs> like would have been boring, right? So there was a Cuban Missile Crisis, right? Where we almost had a nuclear war. There's, there's plenty of like literature you can read about how there was almost an accidental war um, because people thought like there was an attack going on that was, <coughs> wasn't, okay? So the more countries, the more risks of accident, miscalculation. With new nuclear powers, they have limited uh, procedures, command control, communication, intelligence procedures, right? So if your command functions are weaker, you can't properly gather intelligence, you might think you're under attack when you're not. You're gonna be paranoid that you can't respond in time or you can't respond properly, right? So that makes it kind of more likely in your situation you're gonna have a nuclear war. There's a short distance, right? Like a lot of these are like, you know, India, Pakistan, right? North Korea, South Korea, like Japan, China. There's not, there's really, I mean, there's not even much time for the United States to get early warning of like a Russian attack, but it's still like, like 25, 30 minutes. Okay. North Korea, I mean, India, Pakistan, you're talking like minutes, right? So that makes it even quicker. Like they, they might kind of get in a crisis situation. Somebody might launch a nuclear weapon because they basically don't have any time to respond. They could fear that they could be decapitated, which basically means like, well, gee, if we don't shoot the nukes now, we might not be here to, to shoot them because ones could be about to fall on our head, right? So given the geographic proximity, that makes deterrence a little bit more difficult. The other big problem is there's no second strike capabilities, right? Like if these countries just get nuclear weapons, they're just gonna have a few, okay? Which kind of incentivizes another country to take them out before they develop their capacity to initiate a second strike, right? So it's like, gee, if India only has, if a new country only has three nuclear weapons and I can get rid of those, I can nuke those three, I'm not really at risk because they don't have the capacity to respond. Deterrence only works when there's retaliatory, right? Like deterrence only works if you can say, well, gee, if I nuke A, A can't like nuke back, okay? So in an immature nuclear situation where countries just have a few nuclear weapons, they're really vulnerable to what either a preemptive war, okay? A preemptive war is when you like literally kind of start a war. A preventative war is like, I'm gonna shoot a nuke because I think they're about to like attack me and I wanna prevent that war from like happening in the future. Um, then there's obviously, as I said, terrorism, right? Which deterrence doesn't apply to. There's a book called The Spread of Nuclear Weapons and there's these two theorists, all right? Kenneth Waltz and Carl Sagan and they have dueling chapters, it's like, they each like lay out, it's like a, it's really like a public forum debate kind of. They each lay out their main arguments in a chapter, like for like why proliferation is bad. 
then like why, you know, that's Sagan, why proliferation is good, that's Walt. Then there's a subsequent chapter where they like respond to each other's arguments and basically do a rebuttal. And then there's kind of like a concluding piece, which is basically like the summary or the final focus. <coughs> but why, having said that, why might nuclear proliferation be good? Well, it deters obviously conventional conflict. It could deter superpowers from attacking smaller countries. Arguably, it undermines U.S. hegemony. Some people think U.S. hegemony or global leadership is bad, right? Makes it harder to push our power around when, like, unless we're willing to start a nuclear war, which might not go so well, right? Um, so, you know, you can't argue that this, right, nuclear proliferation is good. As I mentioned in the lecture, those are the main arguments. What is true? Now, again, I asked this question last week. And it ultimately gets down to kind of this, like what, well, and, and there might be a secondary question here too, right? Like, is the pro correct that like, if we kind of strengthen this regime, well, first of all, they have to win uniqueness that the regime, like in two ways, like they could either win that it's going to be undermined in the status quo. And then they like give it like that boost, right? Like they stop it from falling down or just like, we're going to strengthen it a little more. And that little more is like important to kind of controlling the spread of nuclear weapons. Right. So how much is that going to make a difference? And are these norms, right? Go back to the right, go back like to the beginning for like why countries get nuclear weapons. Well, it's, you know, like, do we have, do we want to push a norm that says like, it's not prestigious, right? Do we want to kind of push a regime that's going to put sanctions on to put like economic and military pressure on a country? Like how much does that drive them? Right. <clears throat> Versus like security. Right, like, and then, okay, Japan loses, say, you know, I mean, it is, I mean, Japan does, like, as I said, right, last week, like, one of the reasons Japan doesn't want to have, okay, or Japan doesn't want us to get rid of first use is that they think it'll reduce their security, right? They're afraid that if China attacks them, that they don't want to rely on Japan and U.S. like conventional forces, okay? Same with South Korea, but like, okay, but there are other factors, right? Like, there's U.S. conventional forces. There's diplomatic and economic pressure that the U.S. can put on Japan. There's a lot of evidence that says there's no popular support in Japan to go nuclear, right? So there are other things that like drive this, right? Like, like you now security is a huge variable. You can find cards that say like that's the most important variable, right? And the answers to the and say those other variables aren't important, right? But I'm just saying there are multiple factors at play. But like, what is really going to? There's two questions, right? Like what is really going to kind of drive like this proliferation? And then the second question, which often gets lost in the debates and almost kind of got lost here a little bit is like, but who's going to get the nuclear weapons under which scenarios? And like, in other words, and, and scenarios, I mean, broadly, right? Is it our allies? How bad is it for our allies to get nuclear weapons versus how bad is it maybe for like Iran to get a nuclear weapon? Or, and I, I keep saying Iran because I'm like kind of struggling a way to like come up with other examples, right? Like, what other countries could get like, I mean, Iraq, are they going to get nuclear weapons? Like, what are the like quotas? Syria, right? Like, what other kind of enemies of the United States that are like really significant threats? Like, or even just significant threats in the region? Like, don't already have nuclear weapons or like have it like, how is Syria going to get nuclear weapons? I mean, the place is basically like, okay, falling apart. Okay, Iraq, they're going to get like nuclear weapons, right? And like, or what? I mean, no one thinks anymore that like Brazil and Argentina are going to get nuclear weapons, right? So like, but anyhow, like you can kind of, you can kind of press people on the specifics and it's easy on the con to talk about our allies, right? Now allies don't threaten the United States. So like I say, they could, you know, cause arms races and wars in those regions, but that's like a little bit like theoretical, right? But Anyhow, there's stuff there to unpack. I can't like unpack it all and like, you know, there's no magic answers here. But those are some things to kind of think about. Now, I, having said all that, okay, about the NPT is the constraining force. One thing I do kind of want to talk about at the end is some people think the NPT is like, eh, not so great. Okay, they say, A, it facilitates nuclear technology transfer to countries that didn't already have it. They say, B, it allows people to kind of cheat, to like play along and get nuclear weapons while pretending to abide by this regime. And C, it results in the sanctioning of countries 
and sanctions like destroy the economy, like increase nationalism, um, war, poverty, like all these kind of things. So you can kind of, there is like a kind of an NPT bad side that you can make. And there's some evidence in the debate of files about that. Um, I think that's all, yeah. So, but getting, you've really got to get ready to debate like this argument. It's, I, I would be shocked if it's, I mean, I would be like a hundred, I don't know what a hundred percent shock means, but I think there's almost no chance of you going through a tournament and not debating this at least one debate. Okay, I'd say that, that you know, you can never say 100%, but that's like as close to 100% as it gets. I'm saying there's probably a, like a chance that's greater than 80 that it's gonna be in every debate that you have. Okay, not as the only argument, right? But like as the one of the most important arguments in the debate. Or like, it's gonna be there. Like you've gotta debate this. Like it'd be like debating Medicare for all and not being prepared to debate whether Medicare for all saves lives. Okay, or whether it costs money, like, right? Like, there's a lot of details within those, but at least you've got to kind of generally be prepared for like Medicare for all saves lives, Medicare for all is expensive. If you're not ready to debate nuclear proliferation and all the details and think through these arguments about how they flush out on both sides of the debate, then like you are you're going to debate tournament without being prepared to debate Medicare for all saves lives. Um, okay, that said, are, are there any questions? And let me check the chat. You can type them in the chat if you want. Okay, or what if you exactly, have any other questions about the topic or anything like that, I'm happy to take them. Um, what are, like, how do we know that Israel has nukes? Has Israel kind of like said, like indirectly said it or yeah i mean there's a lot of ways one of them you just identified right it kind of like hinted at it without setting it we have intelligence right now obviously we probably have we, we probably know for sure through like i mean we're they're an ally right so like we have secret intelligence there's other things people can discern from like you know certain facilities that exist that like are kind of public but like or at least you know now knowable by like Google Earth or something like that, right? Nuclear material that's been like transferred around, the fact that they won't deny that they have nuclear weapons. Um, and now too, it's just been a long time. Like even since I debated in the 80s, people kind of said like, it's known that Israel has nuclear weapons. Is it possible to find empirics on anything? Like it depends on anything, like, you know, you know, not, not, you know, not to give you just a, like a kind of a smart ass answer, of course, but like, so on some issues related to this, right? Like, so, you know, people like empirics, like, well, one, have we ever had a nuclear war? Yes, like the US launched nuclear weapons when it was afraid it was gonna take on uh, more civilian casualties. So that's an empirics. Uh, every weapon that's ever existed has eventually been used, uh, both in World War II and kind of abroad. Do we have any empirics that say, or is it, do we have empirics that say the nuclear proliferation regime, the NPT, is slow proliferation? I think we do, right? I mean, only three countries have gone nuclear, right? Depending on how, like, you look at Israel or not, maybe four, over what, 50 years? Like, that's pretty good, right? And some countries, even though we've added some, like I say, like, <coughs> South Africa gave up its nuclear weapons right? Argentina and Brazil kind of like reverse course in like when I debated in the Latin America topic in the 80s, they were kind of like heading in that direction. These countries that like were part of Russia, like they gave up, that's a big deal, like they gave up their nuclear weapons. So do we have empirics that the regime generally works? Yes. Um, do we have empirics that say if you lose a security guarantee, like if the U.S. takes away its like first use policy, the countries go nuclear. Of course we don't, because like we haven't taken it away ever, right? Um, so we kind of don't have empirics on that. Do we have empirics that say like there was almost an accidental nuclear war, or almost a miscalculate? Uh, yes. Okay. Well, I guess there was just an anniversary of this in like August. I forget there was a. There was a Russian, you can look this up, there was a Russian general, his name starts with a P, I guess most Russian names do, but 
It's not the same story to the P. Just look it up. There was a anniversary of this in August. He just kind of was like, look, we're not under nuclear attack. I don't think the U.S. would just like straight nuke us. And so he didn't do anything. And people say like that kind of saved the world. Like we almost had a nuclear war in the Cuban Missile Crisis. Like you also can make arguments about like, okay, yes, nuclear war is low risk. Like I talked about that like in the first class, but like, do you want to risk a nuclear war? Right? Like think maybe you're willing to do something where you risk getting a bad grade on a test, but you're going to do something where you risk failing a class for a year or no. Right? So um, I know it's tough. Like we talk about this a little bit, like the absolute, you know, you can find some empirics about arms races increasing the risk of war. They're small, right? Like, you know, like 2% or something like that. Um, I will say in the demo debate, I think the debaters kind of figured it out. Like they didn't, I don't, I mean, I only watched it like once while I was kind of editing the video, but like, I don't think they had any embarrassment at all. So the one thing you kind of have to realize is that no one's really going to have any, right? And if they do, it's going to kind of be like kind of random and like kind of borderline irrelevant, like a generic card. This is like arms are just increase the risk of war by 2%. Right, so everyone's gonna, it's not like, you know, these topics like Medicare for all, like uh, uh, <coughs> gun control, background checks, right? People do like a lot of these little studies that are like, you know, you can debate how good they are. They really try to quantify things a lot, but that's just kind of not how international relations works, right? We don't kind of like try to like quantify every risk. Right? Like, if the president was seriously considering launching nuclear weapons, he would never be sitting there saying, if I don't, there's going to be a 3% risk of this, or if I do, there's going to be a 4% risk of that. Right? There's really no way to kind of do this a little bit. But I get the struggle, right? Like, and we talked about this last week, right? Like, judges, like, some, for some judges, is like really important. For some other judges, it's like not as important. And, and as Mr. Golan said, like, some judges are sick of it. So, um, but if you if you kind of just wed yourself to like I have to have empirics on this topic, like you're going to end up like not finding any evidence. Um, any other questions? Okay, for the NFU link to MPT, would you advise cutting that link, or would you advise like going for like the like? contradicting what what they're saying about non-proliferation so like uh let's say let's say we're we're pro con yeah. says uh nfu will cause uh mpt to collapse and that's a positive good for the world should we cut the link between like so should we say nfu will not cause mpt co to collapse or should we say it's not a positive good well, let me let me kind of like kind of say a couple things about this. Like, I, the one reason I'm kind of struggling to answer this question a little bit is because the con's never going to say. Like, there's no reason that an NFU would cause the NPT to collapse, right? If except maybe very indirectly, like so, if all of our allies like got nuclear weapons, that could obviously like undermine the NPT because they're not supposed to go nuclear either. And obviously if there's just like all these countries, like our allies start acquiring nuclear weapons, that's gonna like undermine the credibility of the regime. Okay, but you're not gonna, there's no like kind of direct connection to like, right? Like the NPT is a treaty. It's like an international agreement. It supports a norm of like denuclearization and de-emphasizing the role of nuclear weapons and strategy, right? So an NFU is only gonna strengthen that, right? So, if your opponent, so here's the thing. So I, I, but then the second thing I'm kind of saying, well, are you trying to ask me like, well, if are my opponent says like, if I don't say anything about like, you know, the NPT in my speech, and my opponent kind of reads like allied prolif, should I either say like prolif is good, or should I say we strengthen the NPT? Well, like a couple things. Like one, like. I'd probably lean a little bit to try to say you strengthen the NPT and it's going to collapse in the status quo, triggering broader global proliferation, which makes allied proliferation non-unique. Like we strengthen it. Like I think that's like kind of a um, that's probably generally the approach I would recommend. 
Um, the second thing though, you could think about whether you're speaking first or second. Um, you know, it's kind of interesting if the con goes first and reads ally prolif, and then the, the pro kind of reads a flex contention, like they just have a contention ready to go that says like prolif is good. Okay, we'll concede like you're, all right, that like if you adopt the NPT, if you adopt no first use, our allies will proliferate. We'll concede that, we'll say prolif good. Okay, and then obviously they have a rebuttal, they can respond to your arguments, but since you have the second rebuttal, like you can probably win the debate because you just kind of have more time. Maybe beyond what like you were asking, um, but like I think you're kind of you know if you were asking should I link turn this or impact turn it, I would generally say link turn it, but try to argue the regime is going to collapse in the status quo to also make their arguments not unique. Okay, um, but I'm saying maybe in certain instances like if you're speaking second, it could be strategically wise to impact turn it because even though I think those arguments are weak, you probably have more time in the debate to win them at least if you flex case it. <laughs> you know, the other thing too, I'd like to say, I was, I had uh, a class with my uh, like regular debaters, regular essays, because I'm the coach, like before this, it's like, all right, we got to get the cases done so like you can practice. You got to kind of, this is like nuclear deterrence theory and like all this kind of stuff is pretty much all brand new for most high school students. All right, especially in PF, you usually don't debate these kind of issues. So you really need to kind of like get your cases done, get like some basic rebuttals done to the core arguments and start debating. And make sure all your practice debates have like NPT and allied prolif in them. Even if you're not planning on running those arguments in the debate, you are going to debate them. And if you go to the tournament without having any practice on them, it's going to be hard to win. Regardless of like how good your cards are or like how much you read, like You've got to debate these arguments before you get there. Any other questions? All right, well, thanks for coming. I'll probably do one more class next Monday. Uh, maybe on miscalculation accidents, I'm not really sure, but uh, probably maybe that and a little bit of whether or not other countries will copy our NFU's policies. Because if you get through the accidents miscalculation and whether or not other countries will copy our policies, which is really kind of silly, you're going to be pretty prepared. <coughs> All right. Okay. Very good. Thanks, Stefan. You're welcome. Thank you. Bye. Thanks.